Hi, I'm Tammy Potter, and welcome to the Pregnancy Process Podcast, a show designed to help you navigate the hugely transformative journey to motherhood, where you'll hear the unique experience of experts in this area and the incredible stories of women sharing their conception, pregnancy, and postnatal journeys so that you can have a healthier, more informed pregnancy. In today's episode, Birth Unbridled and Uncompromised, we dive into a paradigm shift in birth care that centers on women's voices, choices, and autonomy. Guest Jacinta Reed, an endorsed midwife and co-founder of Avenir Life Midwifery, pulls back the veil on the harsh realities too many birthing mothers face in hospitals with overworked staff, invasive procedures done more for convenience than medical necessity, and an alarming lack of respect for women's bodies and choices. Prepare to be inspired as Jacinta shares her courageous journey from systemic disempowerment to a modern midwifery philosophy that reclaims birth as a profound rite of passage, not an illness in need of management. This episode challenges outdated narratives of birthing as an emergency rather than a physiological process and restores birth to a framework that trusts women's bodies and prioritizes informed consent over medicalized control. Because all women deserve to feel safe, supported, and celebrated when birthing, not coerced. Jacinta, thank you so much for your time today. It's fantastic to have you here with us. Thank you for having me. Thanks for asking me to come on and talk. Oh, I'm really excited about this podcast because especially in this day and age and with everything that's happening in terms of the birth process and with the Royal Commission happening around Mm. birth trauma, it really is no secret that midwives are facing many challenges in current hospital settings and the current model. From things like staffing shortages and high workloads, you've got lack of resources and funding to lack of integration and autonomy where Mm. you're seeing their decisions being undermined in that labor and birthing process. And you've recently moved from practicing midwifery in a hospital-based setting to a private setting. And I'd love for you to talk me through your reasons for making this change, especially as you were working in a hospital setting for over 10 years, correct? Mm, I was, yeah. And I think for me, it was just this moment of I want to say it was almost like an awakening. It was almost like I had this moment of just what are we doing in this hospital setting and the outcomes that we're getting could absolutely be improved. And I guess when you're in that environment for that amount of time, you do start to see trends. You do start to see certain things happening the way that things are flowing, the way that things are working or not working. And I think when you are in a hospital setting that is busy, short-staffed, you can get caught up in the way of working to the hospital systems. And I think you have to almost fit in with that flow of things because of how the hospital's running. And so you can get really caught up in that and you can get a little bit you lose sight of what the real goal is and it's to ensure that women are cared for safely, respectfully and I think when things are busy that can get a little bit missed and so for me I was just seeing these certain trends and I was speaking to women. I was talking to women, friends of friends and I'd go to lunches or birthday parties and I I was listening to women's stories and I thought There's a lot of women who are really unhappy with their experience. There is a lot of women with quite significant birth trauma. And when you listen to the stories, it's almost it's you absolutely can't ignore that. You have to do something about that. And so I was then going into the hospital doing my shifts thinking, oh, gosh, we could do this so much better. And so I, in 2020, decided that I would do further study to become an endorsed midwife. And that's quite a process. We have to do 
further study. We have to prove that we've done a certain amount of hours within the hospital across all settings. We essentially have to be approved to become endorsed midwives. And so I went through that process. I started working with a private midwife, just dabbling my toes in the space. And when I saw the outcomes and when I saw women postnatally down the track and how they felt about themselves and their birth and their parenting, I knew I the difference was huge. And I, I just had this realization of, wow, this really works. And women are really satisfied with this model of care. And there's not a lot of options for women. And yeah, I was working in the hospital and I thought, okay, there's a better way to do this. And thankfully, Talia and I came together and birthed Avenir together and came up with this idea of our own private midwifery practice. And we have some beautiful midwives that work with us who we worked with at the hospital. And we essentially just had the goal of supporting women's choices. I think in this model of care, women are able to really make decisions that align with their values. They don't feel the pressure. There's no time constraints. There's no coercive language. It's We actually genuinely trust that women can make decisions that feel right for them and their family. And that's our role as a midwife is to give them the information and then essentially support whatever decision they make. And I think it doesn't happen in the hospital because it's busy There's policies, procedures and guidelines and they have that in place. It's a big system. It has to work and it has to run well. And I think what gets missed is women's choice. We could certainly go on a definite patriarchy kind of tip here when I talk about this kind of thing. And I have to always be careful that I don't go down those medicalized, male-dominated, decision-making, patriarchy-type tips. You did, you've mentioned a couple of things here that I would like to go into a little bit more detail about. So you mentioned that you started advocating for things to change in the hospital setting. How did the hospitals, and I understand that you probably aren't going to be able to go into full detail about this, but how yeah. did the hospitals respond to your advocating for change? Very poorly. I think when something's been working the way it's been working for so long, change, people don't like change. They don't like, people get a little bit funny with someone wanting to do things a little bit differently or even just almost calling them out. There would be times where I would say to people, That's really outdated. Actually, we don't need to be recommending that. That's based on really outdated research. And actually, this is what's coming out now. And yeah, it's not taken very positively because I just think people get set in the way that they do things. And midwifery and obstetrics has been around for a very long time. And I think a lot of practices are just, well, that's what we've always done. And even we know when new policies are written, our all new research comes out, it takes about 10 years for that research to come into practice. Yeah, it's not, it wasn't taken very well at all. And I think that's when I had this real drive to step away from that because I knew that I couldn't make a difference in the hospital, but I could make a difference in private practice. Mm. You've already mentioned things like you could see trends of things that were working, things that were not working, how these really changed the outcomes for women and how people would using outdated research and outdated methods. Can we talk in a little bit more, are we allowed to talk in a little bit more detail about some of those trends that you were seeing and methods that were being used that were based on outdated research? Can we go into more detail about those? Yeah, absolutely. I think the big one is vaginal examinations. All women who present to hospital in labour are offered a vaginal examination, offered being maybe more so told that they need a vaginal examination before they can transfer to the birthing suite. And this is for all women. So any woman that presents a vaginal examination is usually something that happens straight away. And we know through the research that vaginal examinations are very disruptive to a woman's physiology in labor, particularly if that woman doesn't know who's doing that examination. She's just stepped into a place that's really unfamiliar to her. And now she's having someone perform quite an invasive procedure on her 
in the midst of, of laboring. And actually, vaginal examinations don't really improve outcomes for women having normal low risk physiological births they can be very subjective so one midwife might find one finding and an hour later a midwife might find a different finding they're just very unnecessary and so this is something even within the guidelines it's only it should only ever be recommended or offered to women it shouldn't be something that's routinely done and i think what has happened over the years is that it's just become a routine habit almost of practitioners to offer that examination and do that examination and I've seen women be turned away from the birthing suites because they've declined an examination they've been told well we don't know that you're in labor so you can't go to the birthing suite or use of the pool I've had women I've seen women being told that they can't use the pool because they won't accept a vaginal examination and you can't get in the pool if it's too early in your labor and all of this stuff is actually it's very outdated it's very outdated and I think what happens is it just flows on through the hospital and you have new midwives who listen to these things being said and then they take that on into their practice and then no one actually stops for a minute and says where did this come about actually like why are we offering vaginal examinations to every single woman and Why aren't we just looking at them and trusting that they know if they're in labor or not, or simply just respecting their desire for not having one? That is something that I would see very routinely done. I think too, speeding up women's labors. So it's that old, well, you're here now, you're on the clock, you're this many centimeters. If you haven't progressed X amount of centimeters, then we're going to have to do X, Y, Z. And that's actually based on the Friedman curve. And he was an obstetrician way back, I think, 50s or 60s from memory. And he actually sedated women in labor and looked at their progress and then decided that he would plot it on a graph. And most women dilated one centimeter every hour. That's where that came from. So that graph is still being used in hospitals. All women are expected to make at least that one centimetre progress every hour. And if they don't, then usually it is an intervention in the form of breaking their waters to speed things up, starting a hormone drip to speed things up. And again, no one really stops and goes, hang on a minute, this is, this came from a guy who sedated women looked at how they were progressing, which actually these women weren't physiologically laboring, plotted it on a graph and came up with this number. Yeah, that is probably a really big one at the moment is that all women are plotted on this graph and it's a very old, outdated graph. There is some really new research that says actually it's much slower than that, that women don't really, majority of women do not follow that graph. And this is why our current statistics show that I I think it's about 40 to 50% of women will have their labor sped up in some way. So we know that we don't, I don't think it's a fault of the woman's body. I just think it's a really clear uh, depiction of actually majority of women don't follow this graph. (laughs) Like they just don't labor the way that he said women should labor. Yeah, I would say that's probably the two biggest things, the biggest trends or just the routine. It's just that, well, if you don't do this, we do this. Yeah, it's pretty wild. And when you actually step back and you remove yourself from that sort of tunnel vision thinking of this is what we've always done, this is what we have to do, and actually pick it apart, it's, yeah, it's unbelievable, actually, some of the stuff that still happens. Absolutely. You can see that I've been writing notes on yeah. this conversation. Yeah. One, of the, one of the things yeah. I wrote down was wild. I yeah. think just to recap on those, because that was such a great point around the vaginal examination upon yeah. arriving at the hospital, and you're not the first person that I've spoken to surrounding this. So I think a really good takeaway point around that, if you – are feeling strongly around not having that, then that absolutely needs to have be a pre-birth conversation with your midwifery team. So they are all yeah. very clear that you are not comfortable with this. A lady that I spoke to recently, and she's a birth doula and a birth mentor, and she was saying that when they do the vaginal examinations, 
the the doctors or the midwife or whoever's doing it is the first person to touch the baby's head and from a spiritual perspective the first person yeah. to really be touching the ch- the child is the mother or the parent or something yeah. like that so i thought that was a really beautiful point from her perspective and then even just from the physiology of labor perspective and i wouldn't mind at this point going down that track but If you're told that if you're not doing X, Y, Z by X time, that is going to create a sense of fear in the mother where it's, oh my God, if I'm not doing this by this time, they're going to do this to me. So that's not actually creating positive mindset around Mm -hmm. birth. And we all know that as soon as there's any kind of fear going on in birth, it has the potential to to change what's happening in the labor. And then, yeah. and I just have to say this, because when, you, when you're talking about the graph that we're still using, mm. yeah. you look back at what they were doing in labor, they were using like scopolamine and morphine and all kinds yeah. of wild things. Women used to be like held down, tied down yeah. onto beds and given these wild drugs that were making them hallucinate because apparently that was the way that they should be laboring without pain. And that's what they yeah. used to be doing. So you've got to ask yourself questions. What are we doing now? Like we look at that stuff now and are like, that is insane. How could they have yeah. thought that giving hallucinogenic crazy drugs, a mixture of morphine and scopolamine. What was it called again? It was, there was a Um, specific word for it. I can't remember off the top of my head, but what are we doing now that is going to be looked at in 50 years time and just be like, oh my God, I can't believe they were doing that. So asking these questions and having these conversations Mm -hmm. is just so important because no doubt, and by the sounds of it, we are doing things now based on new research and new thought processes of how best to serve women we are still doing things in a way that does need to be changed so I guess it's part of having those conversations but you know like I better be careful because I'll go off on a bit of a tangent about all this (laughs) (laughs) Uh, when we're talking about the physiology of labor because I think that's uh, the understanding that is so important because it is oh yeah it's such a mental emotional hormonal physiological process i think before we go any deeper into this side of things mm-hmm. can you talk us through the process of birth and i understand it's very deep and there's loads of different hormones <laughs> that happen and we don't if you don't want to go into all of that complex detail that's okay but i think just for the purpose of the audience understanding how fear can interrupt the course of labor understanding the physiological process and the mental and physical hormonal emotional side of things is really important so can you talk us through this process and why the setting and continuity of care is just so important yeah so like you said it it can be if you went right into the crux of it it can be such a complex thing but i think the way that I explain it to women, uh, it can be very basic in the sense that birth is primarily hormonal. So for labor to even start, we need a good release of oxytocin. We need all of the right hormones, those really lovely, safe, feel-good hormones for labor to even start. And then for labor to keep in that progression of, of moving along and even in normal physiolo- physiology of birth, that might look like a bit of a stop start. It's just the body producing the hormones at the right time. So it is normal to have these phases of labor where things just naturally slow down and it's actually really normal and it's really useful for mum and baby. And what we need though is that ongoing release of the oxytocin and the endorphins. So 
when we are laboring physio like without minimal disruptions or, or interruptions our body produces oxytocin and it also produces endorphins and those endorphins help us to manage the intensity of labor what also happens is there's almost like a feedback loop that is signaled to baby. So mum's producing all these wonderful hormones and then she's also signaling to baby like, I'm okay here, you're okay, everything's working. And baby goes, oh, yep, all right, I'm okay, you're okay, let's keep this going. So when a woman feels either threatened or scared or even just unfamiliar with her environment or people, her body will produce adrenaline. And that's our sort of fight or flight response. And our body is then flooded with adrenaline and and stress hormones. And that actually inhibits the release of oxytocin. So all of a sudden now we don't have any oxytocin that's being released and we have a whole bunch of adrenaline and stress hormones. And then the body will go, oh, wow, I I don't feel safe. I don't feel comfortable. Let's just stop this altogether. And this is what I would see for women laboring beautifully at home and then making that drive into hospital and being in the car, potentially sitting in traffic, bright lights, all those things. They arrive at hospital and they're a little bit confused as to why things have slowed down or you'd often hear people say, oh, but at home, like things were really intense and the contractions are really coming and it just makes so much sense as to why it stops when you enter the hospital or you get to a reception desk, you enter like a thinking part of your brain. And we know that in birth, that part needs to not even, you just don't even go there. It's not even to be used. And so when you're walking into a hospital, you're thinking about where you need to go, what you need to say, people are asking you questions because they don't know you, they don't know your history, you're being offered things. So you're having to think about, well, is that something that I want? Do I need that? All of a sudden you're being taken out of this really beautiful bubble that you need to be in to physiologically birth your baby to a very high alert state of being. And all your signals are like, where am I? Who am I with? What's happening? So yeah, it can absolutely inhibit the release of of oxytocin. And this is where having a known midwife is so amazing because we know all of the things. We know everything about you. We know your history. We don't need to ask any questions. And together we've done a lot of preparation for birth. And we know that as soon as we walk into that space, we don't need to say anything. We don't need to do anything. We just need to be and we just need to listen and watch because we've had those conversations and so again the women don't need to step out of a place that they feel comfortable in and we can allow the body to just keep doing what it's doing and I do say to women we are a little bit like animals in a sense when it comes to birth and if an animal in the wild is threatened as they're giving birth or in labor they will actually stop what they're doing they'll run away They'll wait until they've found someone at somewhere else that's safe and dark and quiet where they don't feel that threat. And then they'll start laboring again and have a baby. So we're exactly the same. It's amazing, isn't it? Can we talk a little bit about the fear, tension, pain cycle? Because I think that flows in quite nicely to what you're talking about here. Yeah. Yeah. When, again, when there's fear in the body, it creates tension in the body. So when we're feeling frightened, we tense. And actually, they've done studies on this that when even if we're watching something scary, the first thing to tense up is our pelvic floor. (laughs) That's the first thing that we do is that area gets really tight and tense. And then our body feels tense, we feel scared. It's that feeling of what's happening. And then that tension creates increased pain. So when you're feeling scared, and there's tension in the body that the intensity of labor can be more painful for women, they and it's quite interesting because you know when i'm at births at home women don't ask for pain relief it's not something that they're even thinking of they don't have access to it but they don't even ask for it because i think they're just one producing really great endorphins that is a natural pain relief for the body anyway but that sort of tension is lessened i think fear in birth sometimes does have a bit of a place it can be quite i think to tell women to remove all their fear can sometimes be a little bit detrimental to them because sometimes having a little bit of fear can be a bit of a driving force to to 
or something that they can use to create a bit of power in what they're doing, but it has to be in a controlled environment. I, I find it has to be, they have to be free to feel those feelings without the need of being rescued or things being done to them. And sometimes women just have to go to that place and be allowed or allowed, I hate using the word allowed, but being free to go to that place with full support of the people around them. So yeah, the fear, pain, tension, pretty much the fear creates the tension, tension creates the pain. And because it's painful, there's more fear. So then that cycle, like a snowball, it just gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And I actually years ago read a book and it was talking about the fear, pain, tension cycle and actually just changing changing that cycle from or replacing the fear with another word of maybe surrender or trust. And then that creates power. So just that simple change in terminology of surrendering or just trusting or just allowing creates power and that power creates progress. So then that progress creates more of those positive thinking and and feelings and then that just keeps going. I do have these chats with the women that I'm supporting about that cycle and how we can just by changing the way we're thinking about the upcoming birth and how we're birthing can actually just change that cycle completely. And instead of there being tension and pain there's almost power and progress you really work with your mind and your body and things just tend to go much smoother Mm, absolutely yeah so there is and you're right because I can't think of those words off the top of my head but there is like the ultimate the flip side to that fear tension pain cycle Uh, do you know it is really interesting that you mentioned the pelvic floor switching on in fear Mm. because you can you anyone at home can do this and I encourage every single woman listening to this podcast right now to go and do this so one night when it's really dark outside and you're home alone yeah go and turn out all of the lights in your house and put on the scariest movie (laughs) that you can possibly watch and this is probably going to be hard during pregnancy but Put on the scariest (laughs) movie that you can fathom watching and see what happens to you physiologically. Mm. Like you are literally sitting in the safety of your lounge room with the lights turned out watching a movie. But those images and what can happen just because fear is such a mental thing. It can can have physiological responses just by watching something, even though you're in a safe environment at home. So fear is such a, it's such a full body experience. And that's just Mm -hmm. from say, watching something like a scary movie. So you can imagine if you are in a position where you feel if you aren't responding in a specific way, something might happen to you that maybe you don't want or yeah. If you're not allowed to feel the fear and move through it, then something's going to be done to you. How yeah. terrifying. Yeah. Yeah, really. Yeah. yeah. That's just going to add to it. It's just going to wind it up. Now, yep. you, t- you've, you have walked us through a little bit, but let's say someone wanted to hire a private midwife can you talk us through that process and why that might be more beneficial versus going through the hospital midwife Hmm. centers and the midwife birthing units and that type of thing yeah well I think firstly it's just that continuity so it's having a known midwife having someone that really truly supports your choices knows all of your history it's safe and we know this through the research is that when you have a known care provider, outcomes for you and baby are improved and those outcomes are lower rates. So women particularly birthing in home birth setting have lower rates of pretty much everything, episiotomy, instrumental birth, caesarean section, perineal trauma, birth trauma rates are lower higher rates obviously of vaginal birth breastfeeding success so women who do home birth who are wanting to breastfeed actually breastfeed better and for longer and newborn admission rates so babies who were born at home there's some really great research that shows home birth babies are less likely to be admitted to special care nurseries than babies born in hospital settings so you're not seeing a huge increase of babies needing 
that sort of tertiary level care when women are choosing to birth at home. So when I look at outcomes, it's not just for the mother herself, it's for her baby and the family. We know that even when fathers in that space and their their wives or their partners are being supported and it's a really positive experience that dads do better as well. At the moment, our birth trauma rate is one in three. So one in three women have birth trauma and of the women that I'm supporting majority of those women who are having second third fourth babies have birth trauma from their first birth and it really does marry up with the stats that we're seeing and so I think if 0.5 percent of babies like that was the mother and babies report in 2020 I think 0.5 percent of babies were planned home births if that is as low as it's sitting then we know with uh the the rates of everything that we have, that potentially the hospital system is probably not providing the best outcomes. And absolutely, I'm something I worked in in the hospital, and I absolutely saw women who needed hospital care. Like it really does have its place, absolutely has its place. And I say this to women who I'm supporting: when home birth is safe, when things are normal. And when they fall outside of that, then absolutely, it's probably not the best place to be. But for no, it has to be a better option than for the 99% of women that are, are using the hospital system. We know that majority of women have low risk pregnancies. They are healthy, they're well, their babies are well. And so I think the hospital has a place for those women who really truly do need it. But then there's also we need to make it more available for um, more women to be taking up home birth midwives, particularly if it's something that they want. I, I just think people don't even know it's an option. Like women just I don't even think they know sometimes that it's an option out there and they don't fully understand uh, the benefits of it. And so they don't choose it because they just don't know. And women fall into this very mainstream way of doing things. They fall pregnant, they go to the GP, the GP says, what hospital would you like to birth at? The GP sends a referral to the hospital, the hospital contact them and then they're in the system then and then all of their appointments get made and that's the trajectory that they follow. Um, One of the big things that we find as private midwives at the moment is finding GPs who are supportive of us and will actually refer their women to us. I can't tell you how many GPs have turned around to women that I'm supporting and said, absolutely not. I will not refer you to a private midwife. I don't believe in that. I don't believe in home birth. You, I'm not doing the referral. And so for women to come and see us and have their appointments essentially bulk billed through Medicare, they need a GP referral. So there's already these barriers. And if women aren't actually going in with the intention of telling the GP that they want a private midwife. The GPs are not giving them their full options. They're not saying to them, okay, well, you can go private um, at a private hospital. You can go public at a public hospital. You can seek a private midwife. You could potentially have a home birth. That discussion just isn't even happening. So women just slip into this mainstream way of doing things and without the knowledge and without the awareness, they just don't know any different. And I've got so much to say about this, but I think you've already opened up one of the avenues of conversation that I wanted to go down so I can come back to these other points. But what are the other roadblocks or hurdles that you as a private practicing midwife are facing when it comes to caring for your clients, especially if they have been transferred to Mm hospital-based settings and I think that does marry up with something that I wanted Mm. to ask so you mentioned normal right so most normal pregnancies are okay to be having a home birth let's say so yeah what is normal to you and then at what point if something was going wrong would you be transferred to a hospital-based setting and this is a big question. I'm sorry. It's like multi right. I need to work on my questions. <laughs> so so <laughs> what would be considered normal 
At what point, if there was something happening, would you then be transferred to a hospital-based setting? And then on top of that, what kind of, if any, what kind of roadblocks and hurdles are you facing as private midwives when it comes to that transference? Yeah. So again, I think normal, yeah, it can be quite a broad term to use for me it comes down to I guess when we look at safety so safety is probably the the biggest thing so I think there are absolutely women out there who have pregnancies that are very complicated and that could be that there's abnormalities with the baby in pregnancy and that might mean that when baby's born either they might need surgery or they might need resources that we just don't have at home so this is stuff that could be potentially picked up in pregnancies so we might know that baby has some kind of maybe congenital um, abnormality or they've found something which places them at a higher risk for needing say resuscitation at birth so that would be something that would be under that abnormal umbrella placental location so women that have really low placentas potentially covering their cervixes things like that that are just not your usual just straightforward pregnancy healthy mom healthy baby women might have underlying medical conditions that place them at really high risk for things happening in intrapartum or directly after birth and so- diabetes, because obviously that's on the rise. Mm. Where would that sit? Yeah. In? So for me, there's two categories of diabetes in pregnancy. So one is just gestational. It's just a pregnancy pregnancy condition that essentially will go away after birth. Some women, it places them at a greater risk of developing type 2 diabetes down the track. But for a lot of women, it just goes away. So gestational diabetes is usually either managed just with diet And we know that for women who have fairly well-controlled blood sugars, there's actually no impact on baby. We know that if your blood sugars are normal, you're almost at the same risk of a woman who doesn't have the umbrella of gestational diabetes. Our testing has also changed. So that's another little rabbit hole for women to go down is actually choosing to test and where that comes from and the parameters that they're using. Because for a lot of women, they're testing positive for gestational diabetes, but they're never really having a blood sugar that's abnormal. So it's it makes you wonder if that they actually really do have gestational diabetes. We have to look at what they're eating the night before. Yeah, there's a whole bunch of factors that come into the gestational diabetes testing. On the other hand, there are women who require insulin to help with the management of their blood sugar regulation. So those women, we know that when they have quite abnormal blood sugars, that can affect baby. Rates of stillbirth are increased. They do create larger babies that may have trouble with the birth. So diabetes for me, I you have to look at the whole context. You have to look at whether there's medication, whether we think this is actually a condition that's affecting the baby. For women with pre-existing, so it's type 1 diabetics, we do know actually in the research that these women do have a much higher chance of, of poor outcomes for them and their babies because pregnancy can really affect the way that their body's producing the insulin and, and all of that. So um multi-layered with the diabetes and it can range from being absolutely no harm at all to quite significant harm to baby as well to mum and baby so yeah it's just one of those things where I think individualized care really matters because if you have someone that's just not just putting you under that umbrella with all the other women that they're seeing if you have someone that's really looking at your history knows your diet knows your lifestyle like these are things that can absolutely change how you manage diabetes and whether it's still safe or or not safe to birth at home but I am a really firm believer too that women are allowed to still choose the option of home birth even if their pregnancies are deemed high risk as long as they've been given the information there has to be a level of self-responsibility and yes all midwives it, it is absolutely a midwife's some midwives might choose to not take on women with certain risk factors and that's that's on the midwife but then I think 
there's also, there should always be a discussion. There should always be uh, a time and a place for you to sit down with women and really listen to what they're wanting and help them come to a decision that feels right for them. And I think too, this is why our free birth rates are on the rise. Women are taking that self-responsibility and potentially birthing at home with risk factors and not being supported by people who are willing to support them. So then it's like balancing that, well, do we just support them so they're not having to choose free birth with absolutely no one there? Or is this a choice that women are just allowed to make and and that's that and we just have to be okay with that? But yeah, I think in terms of transferring, it's always a case of is this something one that the mum wants to do once she understands why we're doing it? So I'm really big on, I, I will never tell a woman that we, we need to go right now, pack your stuff, let's get out of here. Things are unsafe. I'm really big on, on really breaking it down and saying, this is my concern. This is why I'm concerned. This could potentially happen if we don't go. And this the benefit could be that it doesn't happen and, and all is well. Now you need to make that decision whether you want to transfer or not. And transfer usually is at the safety of mum or baby. If heart tones for baby were abnormal in the labour, if say mum was becoming unwell during the labor or if mum just simply requested to transfer for pain relief or mm-hmm. potentially they're wanting some intervention maybe things have gone on too long for her and she doesn't feel comfortable at home anymore but it's a really yeah it's a really deep question because i think it just so much comes into play when you're deciding to transfer mm-hmm. and It has to be a collaborative discussion with the woman and the family. And I think the hurdles that you get when you transfer is that people, I just don't think, respect the role of a private midwife. They don't fully understand that a lot of the time we're just supporting women's choices. And yes, they might turn up to hospital and the hospital isn't happy with what's gone on or the decisions that have been made without actually understanding that it's not us making the decisions really. Like we're not calling the shots. We're giving the women the information for them to make the decisions. And actually that's what our job should be. It it really should. I think people forget that sometimes. We're not there to coerce women into decisions that make us feel comfortable because that's what it comes down to it's it can be very coercive because it just sits better for us so I think there's this really misunderstanding of private midwives and what we're doing and why we're doing it and when you turn up to the hospital with a woman it's almost like a whole bunch of judgment people want to pick apart everything that's happened and people want to potentially say that things would have been different if the woman was here under our care and it's just this lack of understanding I think and and lack of respect for us and what we do and how we support women because it is different it really is different we really truly support women and their choices and we give them the power we don't have the power and I think in a hospital setting the women don't have the power well you're what you're talking about here is all about individualization and self-responsibility and not telling them what's happening it's actually like you're saying giving them the responsibility to trust that they know what's best for their body and for their babies and if that is at some point I think we need to go to the hospital then supporting that decision absolutely and I think how do I say this I think there needs to be more self-responsibility in the individualization and self-responsibility for the birthing woman for the mother Mm. in the process because I think if we're seeing statistics of one in three women are ending up with birth trauma then obviously something's not right in that system but that kind of comes back to something that I was thinking before and when it comes to pregnancy and birth, women are scared. They don't yeah. have all of the information. They don't, as much as this is something that happens to, I think the statistics are like 80 something percent of women go through the process of pregnancy and birth. When it comes mm-hmm. to pregnancy, many women are scared because they're scared that something's going to happen to the baby. Because when they're pregnant, 
the baby is the most important thing in their entire world and rightly so and you, mm-hmm. you look at any decision that a woman makes if it's a decision between the mother and the baby I don't think that there's I think the statistics on someone saying save me not the baby would be very mm-hmm. very very low if you know what I mean yeah. so their yeah. only thought is to keep their baby safe and they're scared because they don't have all of the information they don't have the education they don't have the knowledge it's like learning a new language right so they're trying to learn a new language all at the same time that they've got all of these crazy changes going on in their body their entire world is changing and they've got so many decisions that need to be made and they're scared so they're also very open to suggestion at that point Mm. you know so they're very open and what you were saying before about the they go to the GP, that's what happens, and then GP refers them to that. That's that because they're scared, they follow that path. And because mm-hmm. they're so open to mm-hmm. suggestion at that point, they just follow along. So I think it's really important again to have these conversations to open up avenues that, hey, maybe there are alternatives out there. Yeah, absolutely. And Like you were saying, women are just really vulnerable. They're so vulnerable. And I actually do think it just comes back to this conditioning that we have. And actually, we're people pleasers. We we really are people pleasers. And we are bought up like that. I still, I call my daughters out sometimes because I'm like, no, don't. If you don't want to do that, don't do that. And, but it's just in us. I think we want to people please. We want to be the good woman, the good girl, and we want to do the right thing. And we think that's the right thing. And women then come into birth and they, again, they want to be a good patient. They just want to do, I, I trust the doctor. Like I, and I think it's really dangerous because it just takes them away from their body. It takes them out of their power. And I think also in terms of safety when we look at how birth is portrayed it's big and scary and loud and rushed and chaotic and that's how we see it in the movies and that's how we are known to believe birth should go and so I think there's a lot of unlearning that has to happen and it can't happen in those kind of settings it has to come from a place of women just really stepping in their power, being supported by someone who encourages that and supports that, and then women doing the work. Like it's there's work to do, there's unlearning to do. We have to really come back to ourselves, our intuition, our instincts to do things differently. And, yeah, I think it it is actually something that's in us from a long time ago and it just presents itself at the time of having babies and, and birthing and, and even into parenthood. I noticed that when women are in their power through their pregnancies and birth, that they're in their power in their postpartum and they make choices that feel right for them and their baby because there's so many forums out there that tell you how to sleep you know, how your baby should sleep, how your baby should feed. You can't do this. You should do this. You need to do that. And why are you doing that? And women are on it. They're on it because they're so out of tune with themselves and their babies because of what's happened prior. And so I think there's so much importance in this and because it can really change the way women are going into motherhood and like how they feel as mothers and just trusting themselves and listening to their babies. And it's Oh, it's transformative. It's huge. Like it, there's so many benefits in this that extend for years to come. Mm. The problem is, is that what you're talking about though is so systemic. It is systemic yeah. and it's gone back for yeah. so many generations. It's not funny yeah. because what you're talking about here, and I think like the monologue that Christina Herrera, I think it was, I think that's her name that did in Barbie. They're like, women, we have to be yes. pretty, but not too pretty. We have yes. to be smart, but not too smart. Because the thing is, what you're talking about is, it really is systemic, the whole good girl mentality and that type of thing, which is, that's how we're meant to to be that's how women are yeah. told that we're meant to be and if you break out of that shell that mold 
then you are the you become the problem you're because the difficult one we, yeah. exactly we are the difficult ones we aren't meant to know what we want we're not meant to know yeah. what we don't want and we're certainly not meant to be able to vocalize it and stand in our power and say no I don't want that I want that because yeah. then we become difficult if so, this is this. Like, I told you ages ago that I'm going to be careful that I don't go on like some. I know, me too. I never thought that I was a feminist, but I feel like that. Yeah. I feel like the more that I work in this space, at the end of the day, it really yeah. is about empowering women to be able to yeah. step into them unapologetically, step into yeah. themselves and be okay with making noise, be okay with saying what they want and what they don't want, which comes back to, no, I don't want a vaginal exam when I come into hospital and you have to respect my decision on that. This, and this is what it, this is that whole systemic issue that mm -hmm. as women, we really do need to start stepping into our power a little bit more being okay with taking up space being okay with taking up with making noise and saying what we want and what we don't want mm -hmm. I think overall and when it comes to birth which is the most tra the, the process of pregnancy and birth is one of the most transformative times mm -hmm. in any woman's life and so this is one of the biggest decisions that you can possibly be making and if there's any time in any woman's life where they should be stepping into their power should be stepping into their intuition and advocating for themselves it's absolutely this time yeah yeah and I think this is where having someone that you've been able to build a relationship with women are comfortable to do that mm. with a stranger it's a little bit more difficult to be like I do not want that but for someone that they've built a relationship with, it's easy to do. It's, hey, I actually don't want that. And they feel comfortable telling you. They feel comfortable taking that on. They just feel more able to share those things. That's and so true, um, isn't it? Yeah. With a stranger, it's hard to do that. You, you don't know this person. They don't know you. You potentially don't want them to think of you as a difficult person or someone that's a bit rogue and a bit out there. But when you've formed a really great relationship, you... Are so comfortable and this is where yeah I just support any decision that a woman's making and if she says to me I don't want that absolutely that's what I'm gonna do I'm not gonna do that thing that she doesn't want so mm, amazing sorry I, I I am known to go oh, off on like rants and tangents I love <laughs> passion coming me out too. Of me. <laughs> so I've got a couple of questions left and I'm gonna try and yeah. them together we've talked about many women not having positive hospital birthing experiences and then choosing home births for their subsequent pregnancies mm -hmm. can we talk about say why this might be a better option than say a c-section mm -hmm. and then talking about c-sections can we talk about yeah. the difference of feedback in a home setting versus mm -hmm. in the hospital yeah so i think again um, me pushing two questions into one no it's good <laughs> It's fine. <laughs> yeah, so in terms of women choosing, say they've had a, a not so positive experience the first time and potentially looking down the path of a private midwife and a home birth versus just maybe going in and having a cesarean section. I think for the majority of women, I think it it's not so much the outcome, so it's not so much the type of birth that they've had it's about how they were made to feel, how they were treated, how they were spoken to, whether they felt comfortable to say no, say yes. And so I think putting themselves back into an environment where potentially they will be disrespected again, their choices won't be heard again, people might not listen to them, being made to feel the same way with a different outcome, a different birth outcome, but still being made to feel the same way. For them, that's just not something that they want to put themselves through again. And so I think a, a huge driving factor is just feeling heard and supported and trusted. And I think that is where they know that if they potentially put themselves back into the same environment where those things happened the first time, 
it's very likely that those same things will happen again, even when you're going in more prepared. I've seen women come into birth incredibly prepared and knowledgeable and have really great birth plans and be very easily influenced by the way that people are talking to them and the things that they're saying to them and how coercive it can become. And so all of a sudden, all of these all of this like strength that you had just gets pulled away. It just gets broken down until you're like at a point of not even being able to advocate for yourself. So I think women choose home birth to remove themselves from, from the potential of that happening again. I absolutely know women who have opted for a repeat cesarean section because of birth trauma and they've gone maybe down the private route with a private obstetrician in a private hospital, it's all booked in, it's all planned. And for them, that is really healing. And that is what they need for their birth. Absolutely fine. As long as they're treated with respect and their experience in the sense of how they were made to feel is different, then that's the outcome. That's the primary goal. That's what we're aiming for. Not so much how they're birthing. I actually had a friend of mine who had a repeat planned cesarean section she had quite a traumatic birth with her first that ended in a cesarean section and she got in contact with me and for her she all she wanted was to bring her baby up from the cesarean and put her straight on her chest she didn't want to go through all the labor stuff she didn't want a home birth she didn't want to do any of that she just wanted she was happy for a cesarean but she wanted to be heard and she wanted to have the choice to bring her baby up to her chest. So I worked with her really closely. I spoke to the obstetrician that was doing the cesarean that day. I spoke to the uh, anesthetic team in theatre and I said, this is what she wants. This is really important for her. Like we need to respect this and, and allow this to happen. And at that particular hospital, it's not something they would do all the time. They're very strict on sterile fields and women aren't allowed to put their hands in front and We did that for her. She was able to bring her baby up and have her on her chest. And still to this day, she talks about how healing that was for her. And honestly, it was just because she was listened to. She was just, her choices were respected and she was listened to. So I think that's what it comes down to is just how women are made to feel. Not so much whether they end up with a vaginal birth or another cesarean. It's the process to to that point. In terms of VBAC and and success rates and... (laughs) It's actually mind-blowing when we look at the research. I was listening to a podcast the other day where they were talking about VBAC rates and versus hospital and home, and 80% of women planning a VBAC in hospital will have a repeat cesarean. High. So they're not having vaginal births, even if they're going in with the intention of having a vaginal birth. And on the flip side, it's actually the complete opposite. So over 80% of women planning a home birth after a cesarean will have a vaginal birth. So it's to me, I look at that and think women can birth vaginally after a cesarean. Absolutely they can because if 80% of women who are planning a birth at home achieve that and 80% are planning that at hospital and not achieving that, what's the fact, where does, you know, what's the influence there? And I think it's the way that, vaginal like VBAC women are managed in the hospital it's very it's very rigid there's very strict rules around what they can and can't do and all of the monitoring and it comes back to the physiology it comes back to the hormones if if there's fear and there is there's care provider fear and that just trickles down and women their physiology is affected their hormones are affected and We see that in the statistics. They're just not having the same outcomes as women who plan to birth at home. That's amazing, isn't it? Care provider fear. I think there have been a number of things that you've mentioned today that is just that whole word coercive. Yeah, because a lot of people think that coercive control is solely relational, right? They don't actually think Mm -hmm. that coercive control can happen in medicalized situations. And yeah that then does feed back into the care provider fear. And just for people listening, if you aren't sure what it, 
taking your own baby out from a C-section. That would be a maternal assisted delivery. And a VBAC yes. is vaginal birth after C-section, just for people that weren't sure what that means. Yeah, but again, that care provider fear, coerciveness coming from the care provider, and then mm. women being in that scared, open, vulnerable position, you can see how decisions would change. Now, yeah. I have one last question for you. Yeah. And that's the question that I ask everybody on the podcast. What is the one thing you wish all women knew before having a baby? I think for me, it comes back to that inner belief and inner knowing. And I think I wish all women knew that everything they need is within them. It really, truly is within them. And sometimes there's a lot of layers that need to get broken down. There's a lot of work that needs to be done. There's a lot of unlearning that needs to be done. But we really, truly have it in us to birth babies and make decisions for ourselves and our babies. And it's in there. It really is in there. And we don't need to always outsource. And we don't always need the opinions of everyone else around us. We just need to come back to ourselves and trust that we know what we're doing. Our babies know what they're doing. Our bodies know what they're doing and come back to that. And then if I I do think there's value in absolutely speaking to people and getting advice from your midwife or, but I think the questions that need to, to come up are deep and sometimes the answers are there. And if they're not, that's where having someone that really truly values you as a human being that can make decisions is really important because you can bounce those things off someone that's going to come at you with the information that you need, not the information that makes them feel a little bit better. You're getting information that's individualized and helping you to make those decisions. But yeah, I think without going on a tangent, it's just truly just coming back to you and knowing that a lot of it, a lot of it is in there. You, you just have to find it. You just have to trust yourself a little bit. Mm, that's so beautiful. Jacinta, thank you so much for your time today. I really hope that anyone listening to this has had that same sense of empowerment and inspiration around birthing and their potential and the power that we hold mm in ourselves as women to do this and the understanding that this is something so ancient and ingrained in our brains and in our hormones and in our physiology from the dawn of time. So thank you so much for your time today. It's been so insightful and inspiring. Thank you. Thanks so much for having me. And if you're hearing this message, I want to say a huge Thank you, because it means that you've listened to this entire episode. Of course, if you have any questions about the things that we covered in this episode or want to know more about me or my other projects, you can find me on YouTube and Instagram at The Pregnancy Process. For those currently in their conception or pregnancy journey, you can apply to join my complimentary but private community, The Preggy Training Crew. And you'll find my community application and social media links in the episode description. And of course, if you enjoyed this episode, I absolutely encourage you to share it with other women just like you. And I look forward to seeing you in the next episode.